to you, Lord. Even more true, you said in your word, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. Just for a moment, amen, just receive his presence. Just receive his goodness to his people. For the Lord is good and he only does good. That's what Psalms 119 declares. Oh, we thank you today, oh God. We thank you, Lord God. You said you want us to be a grateful people. And we bless your name. Just bask in his presence. Thank you for his presence, for his goodness. Like the fragrance after the rain, Lord God, we thank you that we are clean through your word that you've spoken to us. Thank you. 
WRCC. Let's call on his name. Don't Peter Pat, get in my hand the praise, amen. amen. Oh, yes, Jesus. Amen. The righteous run into that name and they find shelter. For the name of the Lord is a strong town. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, y'all, we can't even move for right now, amen. He's just here, he's here. Walk in our midst, Lord God. Touch and heal today, Lord God. Commission today, Lord God. Speak through your servant today, Lord God. Oh, God, have your way, Lord Jesus. We declare that Jesus is Lord. Do what you desire, Lord God, today. Hallelujah. And God, for the love that you have placed within our hearts, Lord God. Lord, this love, Lord God, is tangible. It can be shared, Lord God. Even as we are connected to the vine, we thank you that we draw our sap from you, Lord Jesus. We draw our strength from you, Lord God. And today, Lord God, as we just shake a hand, hug a neck, Lord God, may someone feel welcome in this place. May you heal. May you touch. May you encourage through us today. Can we just greet one another just for a little while? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's walk around. Shake a hand, hug a neck. Amen. Ah, yes. Oh, she feels the presence of the Lord. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, want to welcome our Global Faith family today. Thank God for you tuning in and being with us today. God bless you. We pray that the same presence of God that is here is the very same God who is there with you. We speak blessings over you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Ah, that's it. Come on, love on one another. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. He's easy to love. That's it. Love on one another. Loves the Jesus in you, it's so easy. Yeah, it's so easy. Easy to love. Oh, 
that's a beautiful thing, body of Christ. Jesus in me, love the Jesus in you. The Jesus in me, love the Jesus in you. It's so easy. Bless your name, Lord God, bless your name. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will to rejoice in it. We make our mind up to rejoice in Him. Oh, bless your name, Lord God. Oh, your name is a strong tower. Do what you're famous for, oh God. Bless your name, hallelujah. Father, hallelujah, even as we're preparing for the reading of God's word, amen, let's not take that lightly, how we do that, praise God, it's an honor to be able to share and, uh, you know, read the word of God in America, amen, the Bible says that we have not, we're not striving against sin to the point that we're shedding our blood for it, amen, but praise God, some places around the world, they are. Some places the word of God is not freely read. They are underground churches. But we thank God that we can openly declare the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Minister Mary. Praise God. Jesus, Jesus, there's something about that name. Oh, so grateful and thankful. So we're going to prepare uh, for our scripture time. Uh, I will start. And you all follow, okay? So, so I would, okay. And and the scripture reference is coming from Acts, the third chapter, verses one through ten in the NIV version. Verse one says, "One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon." Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to bed from those going going into the the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him and did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what, but what I, I do have, have I, I give, give you. you. In, In the, the name, name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Praise God. He jumped to his feet and began, and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they they recognized him as the the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they they were filled filled with wonder and amazement at what what had happened to him. him. Amen. 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 Praise team. Hallelujah. Uh, break every chain. How many are ready for the word today? Amen. Come on, prepare your hearts even now. Go ahead and get your freedom now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes.
every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. today, Lord God, that you are the chain breaker, Lord God. We thank you that it is for freedom that you have set us free. Your word declares to us to walk in the liberty whereby we have been set free. And we bless you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, walk in your freedom, amen. to do this but I praise God that he has the power of deliverance to break every yes. chain off of every person in here anything that has you bound Amen. anything that Amen. you're used to doing that you don't Amen. think you can get the victory from Amen. God has the power yes. to break yes. every chain yes. hallelujah. hallelujah give a praise this morning hallelujah. he can break you free from anything yes. that you are bound up yes. under 
And many times we don't give him that credit. But God can defeat. God has already defeated whatever yes. your struggle is. Yes. Just like that scripture said, that man got up leaping yes. and jumping and praising God. Praising yes. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't play and talk at the same time. Yes. But I will continue that part. I hear the chains Amen. falling. That Amen. is victory. Amen. I don't know if you can see that in your mind, but Amen. that is your yes. victory. I hear yes. the chains. Falling. I don't know what has you bound this morning, but God yes. can deliver you. Amen. God Amen. wants yes. to deliver Amen. you. God Amen. wants to deliver Amen. you. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory. 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 I hear the chains falling. into holy ground amen amen bless you bless you we are coming from acts chapter 3 
And as we are coming from Acts chapter 3, the, the scripture that has just been imprinted or impressed upon my heart is Acts chapter 3, verse 3. And it reads, when he, meaning the man who had been lame all his life or from birth, when he saw Peter and John going in, he begged them to give him something. And so as we are looking at this scripture, we understand that he was expecting material things because he was begging for his next meal. He was begging for his daily bread. He was begging for that which he understood to be what he needed. But Peter and John, having been under the tutelage of Jesus Christ said, no, what you think you need is not what we have, but what we have is what you really need. And so they said, silver and gold have I none, so that what you are seeking I don't have. But what I do have, I'm going to give it to you. And when I give this to you, you will not seek that which you were seeking any longer. And so the man looking at them expected to receive something from them. But what he received was greater than what he ever expected. And so I would charge you this morning as you are expecting to receive something. What you will receive is greater than what you expected. Because oftentimes we expect to receive something based on our physical condition, based on our needs at that time, based only upon what we can see. And yet our Heavenly Father stands ready and waiting to give us something that is more than what we could ever think, hope, or imagine according to his perfect will. And so if you will, let's ride this morning through the scripture and let God pour into you that which he has given me so that you can receive it and so that you will receive more than what we see just based printed on the word, on the book. Amen. Amen. And so as we are looking, we're, we're here in Acts chapter 3 and it says, The lame beggar, the man was born lame. And so if we go back just a couple of Sundays, remember we talked about the man that was born blind. And the first thing before this episode that came to the disciples' minds was who sinned, right? And so whenever there was a birth defect, whenever there was something wrong, the first thing they asked was who sinned, this man or their parents? And so that was the prevailing thought back then that if you were born into this world with something wrong, someone had to have sinned so that you came out that way. Otherwise, you would have come out a perfect person. And so we see with the blind man, the disciples asked that question and Christ said, no, you're worried about the wrong thing. Christ said, we're not worried about who sinned or who didn't sin. It's not even a matter of sin. It's a matter of, of God being glorified through this man's life. And so Christ ch challenged the disciples. He said, instead of focusing on the sin of the person, you need to work the work. You need to work what's happening. It's day. We've got work to do. We've got things we have to do. And so as I was studying the scripture, one thing that I looked at, I tried to figure out how many times did the disciples come across someone that had been born with a defect or a physical limitation. And the only times that I saw it, and maybe my studying wasn't comprehensive enough, maybe you guys will point out more, was the first time at, when they were with Christ, they saw the man that was born blind. And then this time, who was born lame from birth. Now, I, I'm pretty certain they came across people day in and day out. Scripture doesn't even tell us how many times they came across this man that had been lame. Like, how many times did they pass by him before this episode? We don't know. But we understand that they were often laid at the temple because coming into the temple, people had money. 
because they were going to present alms, they were going to present offerings, and so they had money in their pockets. And so the man, as he looked at Peter and John, he expected to receive money because that's what they, people normally came into the temple to do. But this time there was something different. This time when Peter and John looked at the man, they had a prior point of reference to go off of. This time their thinking had changed. This time their way of approaching the situation was a little bit different. And why was that? Because they had been under the tutelage of Christ Jesus. And they had, and Christ Jesus had set the example for this situation in a prior experience with the blind man. And so if I could for a thought or for a theme or just for a frame of reference today, here's my question for you. Whose example are you following? See, the prevailing thought again was that it was something wrong. But Christ came on the scene and changed their way of thinking. And so now when they are in this situation, their thinking has been changed because of the example that was set before them in the first time. So whose example are you following? When you have been with the master, has your way of thinking been changed? Or are you still controlled by thoughts of tradition? Are you still controlled by thoughts of the way things used to be or the what things people used to say or the way that you've been taught coming up to this far? Or has your mind been open because you sat under the teaching of the master? Whose example are you following? And so when we think about that, I, my mind had to travel back a little bit so I am a 70s, 80s, 90s baby, and some of you guys will get these references, some of you may not, but for all of my, for all of my people that are 20, 20, 2000s, you know, you guys think that, you know, you guys have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have Instagram, and you follow these people, but I gotta tell y'all something, following people isn't anything new. We just used to do it a different way. We, we used to have posters on, on our bedroom walls. We used to have clothes that you mimic the people. And so as I thought back, I thought about some of the people that we used to mimic or some of the people we used to follow. How many of you guys know a lady that just recently passed by called Tina Turner? Right? Okay. What about Cindy Lauper? And then Janet Jackson. Michael Jackson, how many of you guys had the glove or tried to do the moonwalk or the, the curls, the Jerry curls? You were following these people. What about Whitney Houston or how many of you guys wanted to sing like her because she could sing and in the bodyguard you watched how beautiful she was? Shaka Khan, anybody remember her? What about MC Light and Queen Latifah? Salt and pepper, some of y'all don't raise your hands because I know some of you had the, the little um, upside down bob, right? The offset bob, come on. Y'all act like y'all ain't lived. I know some of y'all. What about Lauren Hill or TLC, Yo-Yo? And then we had our leading ladies, Angela Bassett, Vivica Fox, Halle Berry. And then what about Lynn Whitfield or Loretta Devine? How many of you guys just love Loretta Devine? And so we would follow these people and we would look after them and we would try to emulate them and we wanted to sing like them or carry ourselves graceful like them or we wanted to just understood or put our put walk in their shoes or at least we thought we did because we wanted to follow their example because that was what we saw and that's what we wanted to be like but scripture teaches us that we already have the ultimate example that we need to follow and so if I asked you to think about Christ what are some of the words that would just pop up really quickly somebody yell a few out Compassion, merciful, loving, amazing, humble, gracious, 
servant, amen, amen. These are words that we use, use to describe Christ. I have compassion, boldness, determined, and we look at humility. We look at his relationship with the Father. And these are the things that we think about. He was led like a lamb to the, like a sheep. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't say a word. He was quiet. But the problem with that is oftentimes we think of him as being meek and weak. And we don't study to understand that he was bold and courageous also. And so what I've attempted to do is I've attempted to jot down eight, eight things that examples that we can take from the father's life, from the son's life. But I challenge you to go ahead and write down others as you study the scriptures and don't just write them down. Look at ways you can apply his example to your life. Right? Because Peter and John, they didn't, just, they didn't just have him as an example, but they followed the example. And so the first example, the first thing that I have is that he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. Yeah, Amen. And oftentimes we want to mince our words. And it's not a matter of saying what you mean, it's how you say it oftentimes. Yeah. And so his words were very meaningful and very powerful, but they were not weak words. The next thing is, he left lives better than when he found them. How many of you are leaving people's lives better because of an encounter with you? You know, when I go on the walking track, um, or when I was going on the walking track, the one thing that amazed me is as I pass people by, like I could get past them, but then the scent of whatever soap or lotion or whatever um, like gain or tide or whatever that they had washed in perfume, cologne, as I passed them, not when I was with them, but as I passed them, I would get that breeze back. As you are passing people by, what kind of breeze is coming back from you? Are you giving people smiles so that when they leave your presence, they are smiling? Or are you giving people frowns so that when they leave your presence, you've passed that frown to them? How are you leaving people's lives? Are you leaving people better than when you found them? And some of you say, well, well, Tracy, what do you mean? Well, come here, lady, caught in the midst of adultery. Legally, the law said she should have been stoned. Well, technically, the law said both of them should have been stoned, the man and the woman. But what did Christ say? He, without sin, let him cast the first stone. So he left her better than when he first came. We talked about the man born blind. Christ could have passed him by, and yet he was intentional on how he healed him. He didn't merely just reach out and say, be healed. But in his healing, he challenged the thinking of the people. He challenged the, the traditions of the chief priests. Because not only did he heal the man, but the manner by which he healed him challenged the people that were around. Yeah. Are you leaving people better than when you found them? The next thing he did, and this one was a hard one. This one was a hard one. He expressed gratitude for people and the Father. But the reason it was hard is because I was pointed back to Lazarus's tomb. And so sometimes it's easy for us to express gratitude when it's a sunny day and the birds are chirping and the flowers are blooming and we can look out and there's a cool, we a cool breeze blowing and we don't have anything in the world to do. We're not worried about anything. We're not stressed about anything. And we can just sit there and we can go, oh, 
It's such a beautiful day outside. The sun is shining. The sky's beautiful blue. The clouds are so white and fluffy. Oh, did you hear the bird? There's a hummingbird over there. It's chirping away. It's singing a melody to me. Oh, look at these beautiful flowers. The roses are blooming. And yet that's not where we find him giving thanks. As a matter of fact, that's not even where the, when we look at the scripture, we are told that he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so here he is in the front of Lazarus's tomb. And not just at the tomb, it's four days. Which means there's a stench of death. And there's the stink of decay. And there aren't any birds chirping. And it's not a, it's not a fair the whale story. And yet in this moment, he says, I thank you, Father, because you heard me and you always hear me. What are we learning from his example? Even when things are going bad, even when things seem impossible, even when we are faced with impossibilities, because those around him say it, even Mary and Martha say it, Lord, It's been four days. The smell is going to be horrible. And he said, roll the stone away. He said, open it up. Let me smell everything. Let me be hit with everything. Let me understand everything that's going wrong in this particular situation. And when the stone was rolled away, see, he didn't give thanks while there was still a stone blocking the path. He gave thanks after the stone was rolled away, after the stench hit his nostrils, after everything was overcome. And then he gave thanks. So even in your darkest moments, even when you're being hit with the stench of death and decay, even when it seems like nothing can go right because everything is going wrong, Can you give him glory? Can you give him honor? Can you lift up your hands and praise and say, Father, I thank you because even in this situation, you hear me. And can we be, can we believe and be assured that even in those situations, he hears us? And so the next thing is, He was honest with the Father in times of struggle. Are you honest with the Father in times of struggle? What do you mean? Think back to the garden. He wasn't like, oh Lord, thank you that I'm about to go to the cross. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's an opportunity for me to love, to learn and grow. I love being in this place, God. That's not what he said. He was honest with the Father in his times of struggling. He was honest with the Father. And some of us are like, well, I don't know if I can say this because it may offend God. Wake up. If you serve a God that created the heavens and the earth, you serve a God who spoke into nothingness. You serve a God who spoke and things came to being. You serve a God who spoke over a dead army that was dry bones and sinews and blood vessels and capillaries and muscles came on these bones and they became men walking. Do you really believe he cannot handle your struggles? Be honest with God in times of struggle. He can handle that. The next thing, he forgave and he offered forgiveness to people. Uh Uh-oh. 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 You know, eventually I'm going to hit somebody's toes in here. 
But that's okay. I already, yeah, mine were a little bit sore when I was walking in. He forgave people, and he offered forgiveness. And lest you say, well, he was Christ, he did it because he was God, he could do that. Think about when he did it. He was dying on the cross, and he was under tremendous pain. And in that time, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what he is doing. But that wasn't the only time. While he was walking the earth, he told us, if you don't forgive people, your heavenly father can't forgive you. And so we have to forgive and offer forgiveness for people, but we also have to receive forgiveness for ourselves. Oftentimes when he was healing people, he would say, son or daughter, your sins have been forgiven. Now, I got to ask y'all something. What would have happened if he had said, daughter, Tracy, your sins have been forgiven? And I said, no, Lord, I'm not worthy of that. Just, just, just leave me be. I would be in the same situation, right? So not only did he forgive, and, but he also offered forgiveness. And so you've got to understand, you have to forgive, you have to offer forgiveness, but you also have to receive forgiveness. And oftentimes we're like, well, you know, I'm just not good enough, or I don't deserve, blah, blah, blah. blah. Do you really think your sins are greater than your God? Do you really think there's anything that you can do that's greater than what God can forgive? Come on, we going, we going. Come on, I know y'all, I know y'all, I know y'all. All right. Number six, he was committed to his calling. Even at the tender age of 12, while his parents were looking for him, he said, what y'all looking for me for? Don't y'all know I had to be about my father's business? At 12 years old, he understood that there was a call on his life and he had to be about his father's business. Now, some of you guys, we see our kids and we're like, oh, sit down, be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. Our example says, that even at the age of 12, he understood that he had to be about his father's business. And so he was committed to his calling. As a matter of fact, if, if we start taking a look at the scriptures, scripture tells us that he began preparing his followers, the disciples, by telling them that he had to go to the cross. We find that in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And the first recorded mention of Jesus telling his disciples of his death is found after Peter confesses that he is the Messiah, that Christ is the Messiah. And when we look at scripture, all there, there are only three recorded instances of him telling the disciples. Throughout scripture, it's littered with references about him going to his death, going to the cross, and being resurrected. So much so that the chief priests and the Pharisees understood that he was committed to the calling. Look, listen at this, listen at this. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 64, it says, on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how this deceiver said, after three days I will rise. So he said it so much that even his enemies understood his purpose. Are you so committed to your call that even those that oppose you understand that you have a purpose? Think about that. 
Are you so committed to your calling that those who oppose you, those who talk about you, those who don't believe you, those who, who, who make light of what you believe in, they know that you are so committed that they better watch out. Because they said that this man said on the third day, I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his, his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. And so even his opposition understood what his calling was. Next. He was not swayed by public opinion. Amen. There are multiple times throughout the scripture when we are told that the Pharisees or the chief priests for fear of the people or to please the people did this or did that. Herod saw that it pleased the people. The Pharisees were afraid of the crowds. But our Christ was not swayed by public opinion. Are you so committed to the cause that you refuse to be swayed by what other people say? Amen. That you refuse to be moved by what other people think? That you refuse to let somebody else's opinion alter your worship? Alter your praise. Alter your prayer life. Do you spend enough time with the Father that it doesn't matter what anybody thinks about him? Amen. That you know in your know in your knowing who he is. See, our example was not swayed by public opinion. And then the next thing that we want to look at is he took what he received from the Father and gave it to the people. Are you taking what you are receiving from the Father and wonderfully, willfully, pleasantly giving it to somebody else? Now, in order to do that, though, you've got to be in a position where you are receiving from the Father. Well, what, what do you mean? I know, y'all y'all all right. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning, but that's okay. What are you receiving from the Father? Because, see, he's not giving you condemnation, so you shouldn't be condemning anyone else. He's not giving you a hard time. He may be calling you into account. But what are you receiving from him? We're receiving grace. We're receiving mercy. We're receiving forgiveness. We are receiving loving kindness. Are you passing along to others what you are receiving from the Father? Even when you don't understand it. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? The disciples were like, we ain't got enough money to do this. Like, what do you mean feed them? Yeah. Who, me feed them? We don't have enough money. So Christ said, well, what you got? And then they came back with five fish, and they were like, that ain't enough either. <laughs> so they were bound, and they were constrained by what they thought they had. And yet when they put it in the hands of the master, and he yeah. took it, they were able to give the people what they themselves had been given. So much so that there were 12 basketfuls left over. And so if you look at what you don't have, if you look at a need that is unmet, that's all you will ever see. If you try to figure out, God, I don't have enough to do this. And what you gave me ain't enough either. Like, if you look at things from that perspective or that lens, how are you going to feed a 5,000? You've got to place what you have in the hands of the master. Yeah. 
And then after he multiplies it, you give it out. But you can't hold it to yourself. Because if you hold it to yourself, you will never see the multiplication of it. Think about that. If the disciples had said, oh, well, thank you for this. We're going to go over here and sit in the corner and we're going to eat it. The multitudes would have never been fed. So they took what they received from the Father and they gave it. And so when the Father blesses you or gives you, you take that and you give it. And then multiplication comes. You don't have to see the... You don't have to see the 250,000 baskets full of food before you start giving it out. Because all they saw were five fish, but they gave it to the hands of the master. And the last thing that we learn as an example is there was a relationship between the father and the son. There wasn't just a knowledge but there was a relationship. Do you have a relationship with the Father? Do you have a relationship with the Father? Now see, we've been blessed. We have a pastor that sets an example, right? We have, we have a lady, of Lady Charsetta, because I refuse to say First Lady, because she better be the only lady. We have Lady Charsetta that sets an example, right? So we have a family that sets an example that we can walk in. But if something happened to Pastor Eddie, if something happened to Lady Charsetta, if they were called in a different direction, while we, we are blessed and privileged to have them as an example, we better have a relationship. And we better be able to hear the Father for ourselves. Because while we love Pastor Eddie, he's still a man. While we love Lady Charsetta, she's still a lady. And so we've got to be able to look to an example that does not fail. An example that does not change. We've got to be able to look to our Heavenly Father who is not like a shifting sand. He's not here one day and gone tomorrow. He is an everlasting God. He has given us an everlasting example. And so we have to be very careful not to be swayed by public opinion. We have to be very careful not to put people up on a up on a pedestal. We have to be very careful to be able to hear the Father's voice. We have to be a very careful to be able to know when God says go and to be able to hold when God says hold. So we have to have a relationship with the Father that is enduring. And so these are the examples that I have on my list. The ways that he has set an example for me. Here's my challenge to you. Water into wine, the man with demons, the woman with the issue of blood, the crossing of the Red Sea. What example is he setting for you today? And the example today may just be foundational for the next example tomorrow or the week after, or the month after, or the years after. What example is he setting for you today? As a matter of fact, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you at this very moment, at this very hour? What is it that he is saying, look, I set the example before you, but you've been a little laxy-daisy on following the example. Is it forgiveness? Is it relationship? Is it prayer? Is it giving? What example is he calling to you, calling to your mind that you need to reaffirm? Is it maybe your interactions with people? Because the thing that I found interesting, and I was out yesterday, I was like, where was I yesterday? I was at the hospital yesterday. 
And so I, as I'm out at the hospital and I'm listening to the different conversations that go on around me, I thought to myself, my God, it's been a while since I've been out among people. But then as I'm studying the scripture and as I'm studying the lesson, he went out among the people. And he interacted with people, not just people that looked like him, not just people that thought like him, not just people that acted like him. He went out among people. And so he called me and said, you got to do a better job. And I'm telling you that because when he calls you and he says, you've got to do a better job, it's not about shame. Amen. It's about God being glorified because if he's calling you to a higher place, calling you to a higher standard, he's getting you ready to use you in whatever that thing is. So if he's calling you closer for forgiveness, you better get ready. If he's calling you closer for prayer, you better get ready. If he's calling you closer to be mindful of interactions, you better get ready. You know, we have a saying that we don't pray for patience anymore because um, when you start praying for patience, good God Almighty, you better get ready. So here's the deal this morning. If he is calling you to something, you better get ready. But I need you to be mindful of it also. So whatever that word is, whatever that thought is, whatever that thing is, jot it down. You better get ready. Go start searching and following the scripture. Figure out how he acted and reacted in whatever that situation is. Whose example are you following? Amen. 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 I want to um, thank you guys very much for your prayers for me and my family. Um, this, the last night and this morning has been a little bit rough, but God is able. Amen. Amen. And amen. Um, if there is anyone in the house today that does not know our Lord and Savior, invite you at this time if you don't have a relationship with him if everything I've gone through just sounded foreign to you if you're like I've never heard that before I'm not sure that I can check off all of those boxes he is ready and he is willing and he is able to to forgive you even at a moment's notice and so we ask that you come to our global faith family if if you're hearing this and you're like I want to know him closer I want to know him more then wherever you are just stop and we're going to pray the prayer of salvation so that there is no excuse for anyone not coming into a right relationship with the father and so if there's anyone that would like to unite with Brewster Road Community Church, I ask that you would come. And if there's anyone that needs prayer, I ask that you would come. And so um, as we begin to pray the prayer of salvation for those online as well as those in the house, I ask that you would bow your heads and humble your hearts. And as you guys are doing that, Mama Diane, I'm going to ask that you would start coming towards the stage, please. And so for those of you that um, may not be sure of your relationship with Father, we say, most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we honor you and we bless you. Father, we are unsure of our relationship with you, and so we want to make it right. Father, I accept that you are my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins. And I confess, God, that I've not done everything right, but I want to start today making new. Lord, I give you my life. 
Take me, lead me, and guide me. In your son's name, amen. And so my Global Faith family, if you've prayed that prayer with us, reach out and let us know. Find a church home that is that is close to you so that you can be mentored, so that you can be um, shepherded, so that you can be discipled to grow closer and walk with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now I ask that if there is anyone that needs a special prayer, please come. And Mama Mary, can you come also? and just the way we are. We love you, Lord, because we know you first loved us. And it is in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we ask it all. Oh 
I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Lord, I love you more than anything. Lord, I love you more than
precious Savior, I, I give you my This coming weekend, uh, Tutwiler, uh, to be uh, minister to the ladies, and we just want to, you know, lift her up before the Lord and, um, you know, pray for deliverance and for salvation and everything that the ladies stayed in, stand in need of, and for all the workers that will be there as well. Uh, so. from Mark, the um, 16th chapter, starting at verses 19 through uh, 20. After the Lord Jesus had talked with them, he was taken up to heaven and sat at the right side of God. The disciples went and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and proved that their preaching was true by the miracles that were performed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. BRCC Faith Family, if you would lift your hands this way towards Mama Diane. Father God, we thank you and we honor you. 
Father God, even as you commanded your disciples to go into Samaria, oh God, we are covering Mama Diane as she goes, God, where few people have wanted and willingly gone, oh God, but she is going as a willing vessel, God. And Father, even as we read in your word where miracle signs and wonders will follow, God, we ask that miracle signs and wonders would follow, oh God, and we cover her with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, oh God. And Father, we pray that there shall be no backlash, oh God, that there shall be no interruptions, oh God, that there should be no distractions, oh God. And Father, we ask that you would cover her body, Father, that you would anoint her from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, O oh God, and all places in between. Father, we pray specifically that you would strengthen her ankles, O oh God, that you would strengthen her back, O oh God, that you would strengthen her hands, O oh God, and Father, that she would hear your voice ever so clearly, O oh God, in that place, O oh God, in the place where you have called her, in her place of anointing, O oh God, and Father, that you would, that you would seal away all doubt, O oh God, that you would seal away anything that would interrupt your flow from moving in the place, oh God. And Father, even as we call her Mama Diane, oh God, that even in there, in the in the prison, oh God, that she would be recognized as Mama Diane and not just Mama Diane, but that she would be recognized as one of your own, oh God, and that the women would come to her, oh God, and that they would draw from her and that she would pour out of her wisdom well that you've supplied within her, that she would not be ashamed of her background, that she would not be ashamed of the things that she's gone through, oh God, for you are using everything that she's gone through for such a time as this, oh God, and that during this time of revelation, oh God, that she would let the ladies know I made it and so can you, oh God, and that she would point them towards you and so, Father, we ask that her sleep be peaceful and that she would be um, well rested, that she would be well fed, that she would be well hydrated, oh God, for the work that you have. And Father, even as you told um, Elijah, get up and eat, oh God. So we speak to her and say, eat from the well, drink from the well that never runs dry, Mama Diane, so that he will use you to pour out into others and that rivers, that he would refresh you, O oh God, even as you refresh others. And even as you give them of the way, O oh God, give them of the well of God, that you would be restored. And that restoration would come to you and your family. In your son's name, amen. Could the, could the um, ministers that are doing communion come up for me, please? All right, it's supper time. <laughs> We're going to go into commun uh, communion service. Um, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. What a blessing we pray it today, Father. We thank you for being here in our midst. And Father, as we prepare uh, to feast at your table, we ask you, Father, to help us to um, receive, which once again, everything that you have for us. And we thank you for every uh, one, once again, that's represented here, and that you would just bless your, 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 your body and bless your, your, your blood, Father, in the name of Jesus. Um, our scripture um, is coming from 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 23 through 26.
same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes may we drink together Next, we will have our announcements by way of billboarding. 